If people want to come on, they will join us. So first, I'd like to welcome you all to the F Food, Culture, and Disease Symposium that we're having this morning. Um, this is, we're very excited. This is our first joint venture with Hotokopio University, our partners in Greece. Uh, so I'm sending welcome from uh, the United States. It's good, good morning to those people and Kalispera to my Greek colleagues. Uh, and I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Vios Karathanos to give greetings from Greece. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, all of you that uh, uh, you joined us. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all of you, especially my colleagues. Uh, some of them are presidents of uh, uh, departments of nutrition in Greece, uh, have uh, uh, graduate studies directors, possibly they will take uh, uh, they will tell us some things at the end. Uh, I would like uh, to thank all of you, especially my colleagues at Radius, uh, who made it uh, possible to do this uh, event, which is not going to be the first one that we're going to do. We have uh, more events in, uh, to come uh, next uh, summer, hopefully in uh, Athens. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. All right, Ohema, next slide, please. So uh, we are doing this out of the Office of Global Programs at the Rutgers School of Public Health. Uh, and I would remit, be remiss if I did not mention that our Dean, uh, Dr. Perry Halkidis will be our first presenter. And he has really been the moving force of, about our creating our global programs. So I am the Associate Dean for Educational Program Development and Global Programs at the Rutgers School of Public Health. And Ohema Bohema, who many of you have been in correspondence with, is the coordinator of our global program and also practice at the Rutgers School of Public Health. And I thank you, for Ohema, for all the work that she's done to coordinate this effort. Next slide. All right, just a little housekeeping before we start. Um, I'm like to ask everyone to um, mute themselves and to keep your webcams off during the presentations. We will have an opportunity for question and answer at which point you can put your computer, your video and uh, back on. Uh, please submit any questions that you have into the Zoom chat feature, and you can indicate whether it's a specific question for a specific presenter or whether it's open to all panelists. So we have four panelists this morning. They will present 15 minutes each, and I will give them a warning at 14 minutes so they know to, to wrap up. Um, we will then have a Q&A session after the presentations. Uh, after this is done, we will then have uh, a presentation of, about our summer program that Dr. Karathanos already mentioned, Food and Mediterranean Culture, that we are, have jointly developed with ha faculty from Hotokopio University and Rutgers School of Public Health. And we will discuss the course and then, ho ho depending on how many people we have who are interested, we may have breakout sessions for you to sp speak in, in smaller uh, groups. Uh, uh, as Ohema mentioned already, the webinar will be recorded. Uh, and if there are any IT issues, if you have any connection problems, please, you can email Ohema at the email listed below. Okay, next slide. So we have four, we're very lucky to have these four presenters today. Uh, Dr. Perry Halkidis is the Dean of the Rutgers School of Public Health. Dr. Shauna Downs is an assistant professor in the Department of Urban Global Public Health at Rutgers School of Public Health. Dr. Antonia Matalas is professor of nutritional anthropology at the Hotokopio University of Public Health. And Dr. Uh, Panos Skandamis is associate professor of food microbiology and food hygiene at the Agricultural University of Athens. So I will um, introduce Dr. Halkidis while he is putting on uh, his slides. Dr. Perry Halkidis is a public health psychologist, researcher, educator, and advocate who is Dean and Professor of Biostatistics and Urban Global Public Health at the School of Public Health at Rutgers University. Dr. Halkidis is the founder and director of the Center for Health, Identity, Behavior, and Prevention Studies called CHIPS. For three decades, Dr. Halkidis' program of research has examined the intersection of HIV, HPV, and other STIs with drug abuse and mental health burden. 
This research program seeks to determine the biological, behavioral, psychosocial, and structural factors that predispose these and other health disparities in the LGBTQ population, and in turn to translate this knowledge to the development of tailored and adaptive interventions in order to reduce disparities. SHIPS also is a training site for the next generation of scholars who seek to improve the health of LGBTQ people and populations. His research program has been awarded over $30 million in grant funding. Dr. Halkidis has authored four books, over 250 peer-reviewed academic manuscripts, hundreds of papers for professional conferences, and dozens of keynotes. Dr. Halkidis has been the editor-in-chief of Behavioral Medicine since 2013 and is the founding editor-in-chief of Annals of LGBTQ Public and Population Health, which published its first issue in 2020. And today, Dr. Halkidis will talk to us about COVID-19 in the U.S. and Greece. All right. Ohema, I'm, I'm, I'm unmuted, correct? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Hello, everyone. Kalispera. Perry Halkidis, Parashkos Halkitis, Stalinika, Ime Elino Americanos, Yanithikas Nea Yorki, Ionismu in Aptingo. And I'm very happy to be with you here today. For our, my American friends, I just said my name in Greek and I was born in New York and my parents are originally from Kos. Um, I am a very proud Greek American. I am incredibly grateful to Mary and Vios for our collaboration over the course of the last few years and what we've been able to build together. I am, um, it brings me enormous pride to continue to work with our colleagues in Greece, just on an intellectual level, but also on an emotional level. I was saying to my colleagues before, if you doubt that I'm Greek, just look at behind me. You see the cross. It's my parents Stefana in the in that little in that little case sitting behind me that guide me every single day of my life. So I'm happy to be here. Well, I don't know. Am I happy? Yeah, I guess I, I am here. If I have to be here and there's COVID-19, I'm happy to be with you. Um, and so um, okay, let me see how I can. Okay, so what I'd like to do is just do a very brief overview of COVID-19 and then really dive into the details of Greece and of, of um, the United States. As we all know, this disease is, a, is a, a, it's a viral infection that causes severe respiratory symptoms, right? It's a virus like that causes disease, much like HIV causes AIDS. Um, while we call this thing COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 is actually the name of the virus that causes the disease. There are a variety of different symptoms. 40% of people, 50% of people who become infected with the virus, however, have no symptoms. The other, the other, uh, the other 40% or 50% have mild symptoms and about 10 to 15% have very severe symptoms. The very severe symptoms when they happen can lead to mortality, can lead to somebody's death. And on, on the chart, there are some of the symptoms that appear. And every day, every day we're learning something new about this disease. So for those of us who have been doing public health work our entire lives, what we know is that since the early 1900s, there has been a real decrease in infectious disease around the world because of the development of antibiotics and vaccines and treatments. However, the last 40 years has seen a reemergence of infectious diseases, including HIV and Ebola and COVID-19 and H1N1. And I believe as a, as a world, we're going to continue because we are so global, we're going to continue to need to keep our eye on these infectious diseases as they emerge, because I do not believe that COVID-19 is the last of them. Right now, here is what the world looks like in this Mercator uh, white person, uh, white supremacist projection. It's actually, you know, the United States is overinflated in this map, but okay, whatever, we'll leave it at that. Um, but what you see here is that the red areas are the areas where there's highest, highest risk. As you can see, the United States is one of those areas. Greece remains somewhat in the yellow orange area, amber risk, right? And, uh, but other parts of Europe, Spain and the United Kingdom and what other are also having uh, incredibly high risk. And you've seen the lockdowns that have happened, you know, in parts of Europe, I know it's happening in, 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 in Greece too. It's happening in parts of the United States. I'm actually in the city of Newark, which has a lockdown start, a curfew starting at nine o'clock. When we look at the disease and how it's, how it, I wanna do a comparison and I'm gonna do a comparison of North America and Europe. And here I have Brazil, Canada, Shauna's home and the United States. And what you can see in this chart over here is that 
The United States has experienced, has 331 million people, has an experience about 250,000 deaths, right? Canada um, has had has 37 million people and 10 and 10 million deaths, and Brazil has had 162,000 deaths. I want to present this to you in another way. Also, hold on a second. Um, which is when I look at this data in a slightly different way, which is that COVID cases per 100,000, what you see, because with this controls for population, is what you see here is that the United States far surpasses Brazil, Italy, Sweden, Canada, and Greece in terms of cases, and it is comparable to the Brazil in terms of deaths. 74 deaths per 100,000 since the beginning of the pandemic in, in the United States, only eight to per 100,000 in Greece. Um, this is another way to look at the data here. On the left side is the positivity rate. On the right side is the mortality rate. And the death rate, while high, while high in the United States, is somewhat worse in Brazil, Italy, and Sweden, um, and even Canada. But Greece continues to look very good in terms of its mortality rate. Here is a map of the United States. And here, as you know, in our country, because we don't have one government, we seem to have 51 governments. And instead of having one federal response, like the Greeks do, we have 51 responses. There's a wide disparity in how the disease and the risk is spreading. The Midwest and the Western part of the country are most infected right now. We on the, here in New York and New Jersey were affected earlier on, but again, things are increasing here. Again, by state, what you see is again, these red states, which by the way, if you've been watching the American election, that disaster over the last few weeks, you'll note that a lot of these red states are red in other ways too, right? So in fact, when you map on these red states to infection rates is a very high correlation. Here we are in New York and New Jersey where things are somewhat better than the rest of the country. Okay, so in the United States, again, I'm presenting the data here, controlling for population. You know, while there have been more deaths in New York and New Jersey per 100,000 because of the onset of the epidemic here early, these other states are catching on really, really quickly. So what do we have to do? You know, there's been a lot of talk in the last day or two about the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine. The Pfizer vaccine is not going to be readily available for most people until the end, the middle of next year. And if our federal government continues to block the transition, it'll be even later. So in the absence of that vaccine, what do we have? Well, we have behavior change. And I've been talking about since March, this model of 4T, which is targeting and identifying highest communities at risk, testing them, treating them, and conducting contact tracing to find who people have, may have infected. As you will know, when we talk about testing, there's not one test, there's actually three different kinds of tests. Um, the antibody test, which is shown here, just looks for whether somebody has been exposed. And most people, it seems like, who have been exposed actually have antibodies for a short amount of time, but then they disappear. Um, but the PCR test is the test that most people are using in order to test for presence of the virus. This is the most accurate test. Antigen, which is a rapid test that we're using also, while good, has less, less accuracy than the PCR. So what I'm saying to people when they're thinking about Thanksgiving and seeing their families and holidays is the week before, maybe you get a rapid test and you get a PCR because the rapid test will tell you right away. And then the PCR will tell you a few days later and you distance until you see your family. Once somebody is identified as having, uh, as having uh, COVID-19, we enact a program of contact tracing. Contact tracing, as you all probably know, is a very old strategy used by public health to identify when people have been infected. This has been used for measles, this has been used for syphilis, this has been used for HIV. It's been used for, a de it's used for um, the flu of 1918. This is a very effective way of identifying people when they're potentially been exposed and further spreading the disease. As you might imagine, this is not an easy thing because it requires that you speak to people, that people speak with you, and that they actually provide you this information. In New Jersey, the government made a very wise decision in May to, to partner with us and with the departments of health, obviously, to develop a contact tracing program. And so the School of Public Health 
under the leadership of Marion Passanante and Mitch Rosen and Colleen Morton McKay and others developed this incredible con contact tracing curriculum that consists of um, 18 hours of training where individuals become uh, get received basic information on, on COVID-19, then more specific information, more specific training about diversity and communication, and then they learn to use the software package, ComCare, um, to, in order to do the contact tracing. We hired close to a thousand contact tracers over the summer, and now the state is doing the hiring and we continue to provide the training, but we put together a really terrific curriculum that is online that allows people to do it uh, in their own time at their own pace. Um, one of the things we have to think about as we move forward is how do we continue to reopen business safely? As I said in an interview a little while ago, you cannot separate this pandemic from the economy and from politics, and they go hand in hand. And there is, a, I am going to just go through some ideas about opening businesses. But one of, but there are really five big issues that we need to think about at universities, at restaurants, and hotels, which is staggering our employees for com coming back on a staggered basis, a constant. Um, monitoring of, of, of health and at Rutgers what we're going to do when we open more widely, which I don't know when that is yet, we will be testing people every week. We have to, we are, you have to increase cleaning and disinfecting, you have to limit large gatherings. Next semester, if we do have classes in person, the classes in person will be very small in number and constantly communicating with our constituents about what, how to stay safe. I actually think that one of the successes that we have seen over the last year has been the success of Greece. The Greek government had a unified approach. It started canceling events and left February before a single death was, was recorded. There were systematic closures of universities, then cafes, and then followed by a full lockdown. And a model called EVA was used to sustain tourism, which again, used the basic tenets of public health. So those are what the government did. But I think there's something else that goes on in Greece that makes it different from other parts of the world, which is the Greek culture and the respect for science and public health, our orientation to family and our altruism, our care for our another, other human being that as a people makes us want to take care of each other. And I think Greek, the Greek temperament and the Greek culture has been advantageous in containing the disease as effectively as it has it's not to say that Greece hasn't suffered also, but compared to the rest of the world, Greece is a success story. The Greek approach to COVID has been steeped in trusting experts and doing things efficiently and speedily and being transparent and strengthening public health and using an approach that marries all people of society and defying cultural norms. In, th in fact, confronting the very, very powerful Greek Orthodox Church prior to is uh, Easter was a huge, huge step for the Greek government. I will tell you, as an American, over the last nine months, this is not what we've done. And this is in sharp contrast to what the Greeks did immediately to deal with COVID-19. Still, what we see is Greece maintained a very, very, very low uh, risk uh, uh, infection rate for a very long time. However, it is seeing a, an increase now. I did actually look at the numbers in the last few days and they seem to be going down again. So hopefully the efforts that are being made in Greece will help decline this. The United States, as you know, infection, we learn, we forget, infection, we learn, we forget, infection again. And we are this constant up and down pattern. It is expected that close to half a million people will be dead from COVID-19 in the United States by February of 2021. New Jersey is, is, also, um, is also experiencing a huge surge. We have a quarter of a million cases. What you can see over here is again, this model of huge infections. We kept things down and now huge infections again. The transmission rate is 1.25. And for those who don't know that, this number means that basically, you know, the number, you want this number to be less than one because this number, if it's greater than one, indicates the number of people that could be infected by somebody who is infected. So this is, you know, this is not the right direction. We want this number to be below one. Um, we've had 15 hospitalizations in the last, hospitalated deaths in the last 24 hours. And while the cases have gone up, what is more troubling for me, in fact, 
uh, if I look at this, is that not only are the hospital hospitalizations going up in all regions of the state, but also people on ventilators, as you can see here, are going up, and that's not a good sign. Here is the, the state over here, very, the dark areas are the most affected. The problem with all of this, of course, is that as we see hospitalizations, we see deaths, and the mortality rate continues to increase. So, in in, in so the governor uh, two days ago uh, or yesterday um, stated an executive order which has basically, like many of the things that are being done in Greece, nor in nor dining between ten and five, outdoor dining after ten, casinos must stop offering food after ten, all bar side seating is prohibited. Uh, social distancing in restaurants uh, um, and, um, and, and individual fully closing dining bubbles must, must be set aside for outside use. So a lot of the things that are going on in Greece. The problem, of course, in the United States is that while New York may be do New Jersey may be doing this and may New York will soon follow, other states are not necessarily doing. So we do not have a unified response. So what does the future hold? I think, unfortunately, we're going to find ourselves at a place where we have high infection rates with close to half a million deaths in the United States. While the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine does have some hope, we're not looking to the second or third quarter of 2021. We're going to look at like white, white spread closures, which we're seeing right now. We're beginning to understand that COVID-19 is not just about your immediate infection and thereafter, but there are individuals who continue to have symptoms for a long time, uh, long haulers. We need to be establishing new norms around large group gatherings because um, this will not be the last pub, uh, pandemic. And we need to increase funding for public health and prevention. And fortunately, under a Biden-Harris administration, I think the American government will be in much better shape. I also leave this for you because I think this is incredibly interesting and it shows the different areas, uh, different kinds of, uh, of, of businesses in terms of proximity of exposure and extent of exposure and shows which are the highest in terms of, you know, both, um, you know, proximity um, and, um, and extent of exposure. And it gives a guide here to areas, businesses that probably should be closed down, ones that could remain open, that ones that could think about other strategies, but one business and one entity is not the same as all others. So it's been my honor to be with here here today. I would love to be staying for the panel, but I have to actually go do another interview at 12 o'clock. If you want to know more about our school and follow me, this is our, my Twitter, this is my websites. Um, I am grateful to my colleagues who are here with me. I am grateful to the country of Greece and its leadership and all it's done. And I wish you all much, 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 much good health. And I hope to God, I will see you next summer because I need to be in Greece very badly. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's great and perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for starting us off on the symposium and uh, we really appreciate your spending the time with us today. All right, so our next presenter is Dr. Shauna Downs. Um, Dr. Downs uh, is an assistant professor in the Department of Urban Global Public Health at Rutgers School of Public Health. Her research focuses on two main areas, the role of policies and interventions to reorient the food system towards the sustainable production and consumption of nutritious foods. And secondly, the implementation of food policies. She conducts research in India, Senegal, Myanmar, Kenya, Canada, and the US using mixed methods approaches. Prior to coming to Rutgers, Shauna was a Hecht Levi Fellow with the Global Food Ethics and Policy Program at the Johns Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics and an Earth Institute Fellow at Columbia University where her research focused on the impacts of intensified horticultural production complemented with nutritional education on nutrition outcomes in Senegal. Shauna received her PhD in public health from the Menzies Center of Health Policy at the University of Sydney. She also, ha also has a Master's of Science in Nutrition from the University of Alberta, Canada. Uh, thank you, Shauna. Thanks, Marian. All right, so I'm gonna talk about the impacts of COVID-19 on the broader food system. So I thought it would be helpful to just start by providing an overview of the food system and what it entails, just so that we're all on the same page. So this is from the high level panel of expert report on nutrition and food systems. Um, so you have here at the top, these are the external drivers of the food system. These include things like climate change, 
um, urbanization, population growth, politics, sociocultural aspects, and all these external drivers feed into the food supply chain, which is agricultural production, the way food moves through the supply chain, including processing, distribution, trade, retail. And this food supply chain feeds into the food environment. And the food environment is really important because this is really the, the point in the food system that consumers interact with to make decisions about which foods to acquire, prepare, and to consume. So the dimensions of the food environment include things like availability of food, the affordability of that food, its quality, um, whether or not it's marketed in a way that people find aspirational. Um, and then you have the individual factors. And this is really the baggage that a consumer brings with themselves to acquire food within their given food environment. So that can include things like purchasing power, which is related to income, um, the information and knowledge that they have, as well as the situational components, such as the home and work environment. So all of these uh, factors influence then our consumer behavior, and that thereby influences our diets. And while some of the main outcomes of the food system include nutrition and health outcomes, there are also socio social, economic, and environmental outcomes of the food system. So for example, our diets, the foods that we consume, have a huge impact on the environment in terms of carbon footprint, just as one example. So I thought I would walk through uh, the food system and how in the US COVID-19 has impacted the food system. So COVID-19 is actually acting as an external driver to the food system. It's affecting all different components and elements of the food system. And it also interacts with some of the existing external drivers of the food system. For example, migration. We know in some developing world contexts that people are migrating away from their urban centers back to rural areas because of COVID-19. So you have COVID as an external driver. And in terms of how it's affected the food supply chain, it's been in several different ways. And this is really focused on the US, but we see this kind of um, reaction in other parts of the world as well. So first off, there is a disrup disruption to the supply chains. So we know in the US, a lot of restaurants and schools closed, and that meant that there was no longer that market uh, for a lot of farmers in the country. So what happened is that those farmers ended up dumping a lot of their foods. So rather than uh, selling them in, in the retail environment, for example, uh, they, they just ended up dumping them, which means there was a ton of food waste particularly of fresh uh, perishable foods, like fruits and vegetables and also milk. Um, and you know, many people ask why not just, uh, just redirect those supply chains to, towards retail, um, but it's just not that simple. And it's really hard um, when you have these long supply chains to quickly make those adjustments. Um, we also saw disruptions to store inventory and any of you that were in New Jersey or anywhere in the US um, definitely saw some disruptions in terms of what foods were actually available on the shelves. So a lot of times you would go in, particularly in the beginning of uh, the pandemic, you would go to the grocery store and there would be you know, aisles and aisles of nothing on the shelves. Um, and then lastly, in terms of the supply chain, one of the main issues um, that led to further disruptions in the supply chain was that there was uh, huge outbreaks amongst the meat packing and meat processing plants in the country. So as of July, about 9% of people working in the meat packing um, and processing industry had contracted COVID-19. And, um, you know, that's problematic from a disparities perspective because a lot of the people working in them in those factories are um, black and brown, and they have obviously already had a disproportionately high level of COVID-19 in the US. So all of these factors then fed into the food environment. So basically when consumers would go to the food environment, there's a decreased availability of some foods. There's also volatility in the prices of some foods. Um, and there hasn't been consistent findings in terms of what was the direction of food prices across different uh, food products. Um, there's also increased packaging. So when we think about the food system, one of the outcomes being the environment, uh, this increase in food packaging, which is really related to ensuring uh, food safety in the context of COVID, has a negative impact in terms of the environment. So while you know 
Now, a lot of the utensils we receive are wrapped in plastic um, and you know, people are using those more often, there's a negative um, implication of that in terms of, of waste. There is also COVID washing by marketing um, companies. So a lot of the, the ultra processed foods in particular were marketed in a way to highlight COVID, but to try and, try and get consumers to purchase more of those foods, which is problematic in many ways. Um, and then when we think about the different types of food environments, which I'll talk a little bit about later in this talk, um, what we saw is a shift to local food environments in many cases, and also increased cultivation in the home. Um, so that could include things like home gardens, as an example, or community gardens. In terms of the, of the individual factors, there were huge increases in unemployment, which obviously affects your purchasing power, and your ability to purchase nutritious foods. We also saw uh, differences in time, time use. Uh, you know, a lot of people, most people were working from home, um, often having to deal with childcare as well. And that creates some constraints in terms of time use. And then when we think about consumer behavior, what really happened was that there were one, there was an increase in cooking at home, which is positive um, and increased online retailing. But when we looked at the actual impacts in terms of diets and nutrition outcomes, there, there was a huge increase in food insecurity. And there's not solid data yet in the US, um, just specific places have some data, but it seems like food insecurity increased pretty dramatically. And that's, you know, there's all this uh, media attention to these lines that were going so far to access food and food pantries. So people were trying to access food and having difficulties doing it. There's also likely dietary changes. And again, there's not good data on this yet, but on the next slide, I'll show you some evidence of some of the shifts that have been made in terms of diets. So this is from the International Food Information Council. They do this uh, representative sample of Americans every year and ask about food choices and what drives our food choices. And so this year they did the survey and obviously they asked questions about COVID-19 um, given the pandemic. And what they found is that more than eight in 10 Americans have altered their food habits as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So you can see in terms of the changes they've made, a lot of people are cooking more at home, which is, again is positive, but also you see more snacking. Um, and so potentially that could lead obviously to more energy intake. Um, and at least anecdotally, I know, uh, at least from the people that I am friends with, that a lot of people are talking about the potential COVID-15 or, you know, weight gain associated with being at home for so much time. So when we think about COVID from a global perspective, so sort of shifting away from the U.S. and thinking globally, we know that it's having an impact on food security. So this is looking at the number of undernourished people around the world. And these um, upticks here are related to COVID and different COVID related scenarios based on differences in GDP growth. But basically you can see that the number of undernourished people were increasing before COVID-19, mainly due to climate and conflict, but that has increased and will continue to increase over time due to the pandemic. So the pandemic may add between 83 and 132 million people to the total number of undernourished in the world. So as part of my work, um, I look at food environments. And so um, myself and some of my colleagues decided to look at how COVID-19 might affect the way in which people interface with their food environments. So this is uh, an overview of the different types of food environments that I alluded to earlier. So you have the built food environments, and this includes formal markets. This is really the types of food environments we interact with in the US. So you have your supermarkets, restaurants, et cetera. Then you have informal markets. You can see here wet markets are included under informal markets. Um, there's been speculation that that's actually what uh, the beginning of the outbreak was in a wet market in Wuhan. And then you have your natural food environments, and that includes wild foods, so foods that you might forage, which I know we don't do a lot of in the US, although some people uh, do forage for mushrooms. Uh, but I think in Greece, there is a little bit more foraging that happens, maybe in the islands in particular. 
And then also the cultivated food environment. So those are the foods that we're growing um, within our um, within our backyards or in our, in our communities. Um, and in terms of, um, of the US, we did see in the spring that there was a huge increase in the number of seeds that were being, being sold in, this, in the country. So people were shifting towards cultivating more. So myself and my colleagues developed a rapid tool based on this food environment typology to assess uh, resilience to COVID-19 based on interaction with different food environment types. So we collected data in Senegal, Kenya, China, and India, uh, basically just going back to samples um, that we had already interacted with as part of our previous work. Um, so we went back to the same household and asked them to uh, do this short survey that's only about five minutes that asks about COVID and how it's affected their food environments. So I'm just gonna show you just a snippet from Senegal. Um, so this is uh, subsistence farmers in three regions in Senegal. And we found that uh, you know, close to 40% of the people we asked said that the places that they access food has changed due to COVID-19. So that means the types of food environments that they interact with has changed. And here on the right, you can see how those food environments have changed. So people are interacting more, are getting more food from the wild food environment, also cultivated and informal markets. So you can see a lot of increase in informal markets and then also food aid. And what I wanna point out here is this is, these are the results from, from Senegal, but what we found in India and also China is that if you had access to more uh, food environments, so different types of food environments, say cultivated, informal and formal, you are more resilient to the impacts of COVID-19. So in India, for example, the indigenous populations that we work with that are very remote, um, they were much more resilient to the impacts of COVID-19 because they have access to the jungle where they can forage for food. They also cultivate on their land and then access informal markets. So COVID-19 provides an opportunity to re-envision our food system. So we, I think that we've had some experiments uh, throughout this COVID-19 process uh, that we should carry over uh, moving forward. So one thing in terms of the formal market, a lot of grocery stores in the US have started to, to shrink their supply chains. So they're actually sourcing from more local producers which is really good from um, a perspective of ensuring that local farmers have a market, but also good in terms of reducing the carbon footprint of supply chains due to transportation. We're also seeing people growing more food, which again helps in terms of resilience. Um, and it's hopefully something that will move, will be carried forward as well as cooking from home. Um, and I think one thing to, to note is that when we're thinking about these different types of food environments we interact with, the types of agricultural systems that feed into them are different too. So if we're shifting from more industrial um, commercial farming to you know, local producers that maybe are producing sometimes in a better way, that can be really positive from a food system resiliency standpoint. Um, so I think my message is the food system has definitely been affected markedly due to COVID-19, but there's things that can we can do to sort of reorient our food system moving forward based on our experiences from, from COVID-19 that could really help to ensure that the food system is more resilient moving forward. So with that, I um, will end and I look forward to the panel. Uh, thank you, Shauna. That's perfect and perfect timing as well. Thank you very much. Um, so now I am going to turn this over to Dr. Carathanos, who will introduce Dr. Antonia Matalas. Thank you very much, Marianne. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce uh, my colleague at the Karapopo University, Antonia Matalas, who is professor of nutrition at Karapopo University. Uh, Antonia uh, studied uh, chemistry uh, in the Greek University in Thessaloniki, and then uh, she moved uh, to the uh, Department of Nutrition at the uh, University of California, Davis. Antonia was one of the first uh, colleagues uh, of mine, uh, the first colleagues uh, chemists, actually, that uh, uh, 
uh, made the studies in nutrition, uh, even when I was in the United States, nutrition was not very well developed. And Adonia was among the first uh, in, uh, in this field. Uh, Adonia uh, started uh, uh, with our university about 20 years ago. Uh, now she's a full professor for a number of years. Uh, especially she's doing uh, the Mediterranean uh, diet. And uh, uh, for that, uh, she has published a book. Uh, and uh, she has uh, over 100 publications. And, uh, and she supervised uh, a number of PhDs. Some of them are already professors in Greece or uh, elsewhere. And uh, Antonia, I'm very, very happy that uh, you're going to give us uh, your uh, ideas about um, uh, nutrition in uh, the crisis and the, in the food systems. Thank you very much, Bios. I'm, uh, I'm also very excited for this event uh, that is taking place among us uh, today. Good morning to everyone in the United States. Good evening for people in Greece. My, uh, in my presentation, I will take an anthropological perspective. And what I want to do is to review the role of animal source food in human societies from prehistory till the modern era. Antonia, uh, can you share your slides, please? Uh, you can't see my slides? No. I thought I did. I'm sorry. Can you? Can you see now? No, uh, I did it before, I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, first, make sure your slides are open and then share the screen. Yes. If you are meeting, missing the buttons to share, you should be able to play, press the alternate key and it will bring up the uh, button. Yes, I, you can't see anything still? No. No? I'm so sorry. Because I... Anthony, I have your slides. If it's easier, I can share oh, them for you and click there. Would you like Ohama to load them? Hello? Oh, Hema, are you loading the slides? So should I load them? I can load them. Yes, please. Yes, please. OK, I'll do that right. OK. All right, so I was just saying that uh, I'm going to review the role of animal source food in human diets from prehistory till the modern era. And why is meat and other animal source foods important and is the focus of this presentation? Well, it's because we know that the spread of certain transmittable diseases is linked to the contact of humans with animals. Can we have the next one? So let's, let's begin by turning, turning back to the era before agriculture, when man lived as a forager. The Paleolithic man, as it is called, lived in small nomadic groups. Fertility was low and the population was growing at a very small rate. 
Societies were organized in tribes of about 30, maximum 40 individuals. That low of a population density made the existence of human specific infections very, very unlikely. As far as the diet was concerned, collecting wild food and animal hunting were the sole food procurement methods. Nature supermarket provided a variety of, uh, of uh, substances and, uh, and foods, and the variety was stunning even by modern standards. So humans enjoyed a good nutritional status. This is what the evidence tells us. We know that the Paleolithic man was as tall as men in, uh, in modern affluent societies, and that nutritional deficiencies were rather uncommon. So, it is generally believed that most of modern human infections have been unknown to the Paleolithic man. Now let's turn to the next one. Let's see the next slide. About 11,000 years ago, first in the Middle East, man managed to gain control over plants and animals. And so agriculture was launched. This process is known as domestication. Man began to produce his food, cultivate uh, and keep livestock, rather than going out to hunt and gather. On the next slide, next slide, we can uh, uh, we move to the uh, era of agriculture. And as I mentioned, infectious diseases transmitted from animals account for many human diseases today. For instance, influenza A, measles, smallpox, mumps, diphtheria, feces reached humans from domestic animals. While some other ones such as typhus, plague, and hepatitis B reached us from wild animals, rodents, or apes. So what is the role of agriculture? What was the role of agriculture in this process? The role of agriculture was critical. Experts tell us that agriculture facilitated the evolution of animal pathogens into human pathogens in three ways. First, it allowed the generation of large human populations. As experts tell us, this is a prerequisite for the, ev for the evolution and for the persistence of human pathogens and the creation of the so-called human uh, crowd diseases. Secondly, it allowed the existence of large populations of domestic animals. Thus, farmers came into much closer and more frequent contact than hunters gatherers ever had with wild animals. And third, these domestic herds served as a vehicle for pathogen transfer from wild animals to humans. Through this process, humans acquired specialized diseases of their own, such as influenza, typhus, and the ones that I mentioned before. And this was appeared after the onset of agriculture. All these diseases were unknown prior to agriculture. Uh, can we click now to see a slide? This, it sounds like a paradox like uh, that domestication of plants and animals, which is considered to be the greatest of all revolutions in human history, in terms of human health acted backwards, but that, that this is the case. And the evidence is very convincing. We have lots of anthropological evidence from skeletal findings, such as the one we see here, uh, which is uh, this particular one is a cranium which uh, has uh, osteoporotic, I'm sorry, porotic hyperstorosis. And uh, these lesions on the cranium are the result of bone marrow hyperplasia, which is observed when we have respiratory infections. And also is observed when we have various anemias. So the prevalence of similar of such skeletal findings from uh, many early agricultural societies in uh, Mesoamericas, in, in Mexico, in, uh, here in Central Europe, in, in Greece, in, uh, the, during the Byzantine times, 
is so high that we know that many uh, infections were inflicting people at the, those early agricultures. In addition, we have also found in many skeletal findings the fossilized bacteria themselves of plague, of uh, tuberculosis, and so on. So the populations who adopted the sedentary agriculture lifestyle, we know that were, they were very prone to infectious diseases. Now, in the next slide, we can uh, see the, we'll see some data on the relative importance of meat in regiments that come from uh, populations of the past, of 19th and, um, I'm sorry, of the past in Greece, uh, both urban and rural populations. We can begin from uh, with ancient Greece in fifth BC century Greece. Can we click? At the time when diet was based on cereals, vegetables, cheese, and wine. The concept of frugality was the dominant dietary model this time. And, and for animal source foods in particular and meat, uh, all domesticated animals, when, uh, when they were going to be eaten, they were always sacrificed and offered to the god. This means that animals destined to be eaten were sacrificed in God's name. Sacrifice was both a tool for expiating guilt of killing and an important gesture of solidarity by distributing meat to the poor. In addition, respect to the animal's life was also a matter of economics. For instance, sheep were more useful alive for their milk and wool than dead. According to the estimates that we have from historians, Athenian citizens, the recipients of the sacrificial meat, ate no more than one or two kilograms of meat per year, an amount which is absolutely insignificant compared to, to what we know from today. Uh, we can click to see some more figures from 19th century. And here are um, data that I have derived from uh, from family budgets and come from the 19th uh, century. And the following one uh, has to do with uh, urban workers. Can we click one more, please, Ohema? And, uh, and this is from urban workers again, the beginning of 20th century. And, uh, and the another one about from prosperous Greeks, please click. The last one is from uh, household logs of uh, very affluent Greeks in, in uh, late 20th and 19th century. These are bankers and uh, businessmen. And what we, you can see by looking at the figures for meat, cereals and legumes uh, is that uh, when uh, affluence and urbanization goes up, the significance of legumes and cereals goes down and uh, Concomitantly, we have an increased meat contribution of meat in the diet. So this, uh, for instance, among these prosperous Greeks of um, uh, 1840s and so on, uh, the value of, uh, of meat uh, that they had access to, 240 grams a day, is a value that matches skirt consumption patterns in affluent societies. I think the value from Germany uh, is uh, is about the same. The, the daily on average meet the uh, accessibi accessibility of people in our days. So on the next slide, we can uh, see the modern uh, situation, the current situation in terms of livestock production, which uh, as a technology advanced, became more and more intense to meet the needs of a soaring world population, but also an ever increasing preference by consumers worldwide for meat. Meat production over the past 50 years has been growing at a much faster rate than the rate of the population growth for this reason. Uh, the average, if we click this uh, little box, Ahima, the average man today consumes 43 kilograms of meat per year. And this 
amount has increased by 20 kilograms since 1961. Of course, there are big variations across the globe. Uh, the average is 43, but for instance, in, uh, in Germany, it's 240 almost. In the US, is about the same. In India, it's only four kilograms per year. So we have big uh, fluctuations. The numbers are striking. In 2018, 69 billion chicken, 1.5 billion pigs, 656 million turkeys, 300 million cattle, and 100 million sheep were slaughtered for food. As you can see on the map, livestock production varies highly across regions. And China leads this race, where meat production has increased 15 fold since 1961. Pigs and chickens are raised mainly. But also, Brazil is a case where the, the volumes have quadrupled during this period. The figures that you see on this map are expressed, are, milli, are equivalents of protein in millions of tons. And it is interesting that one big exception to this global meat eating pattern has been India. You see that India produces much less meat and other animal food. Uh, though the, its population is about the same as the population of China. That's because the Indians stick to a diet based on vegetables, legumes, and dairy. And so their per capita meat consumption has remained stable since the 1960s at uh, less than four kilos of meat per year. So on the next slide, uh, we have uh, this I want to show you some uh, data that I have collected uh, via interviews uh, in uh, the um, in Mani, which is a society. It's it's an isolated. It has been an isolated. It's not anymore an isolated uh, rocky peninsula uh, at in the southernmost end of the Greek mainland. Uh, in, with regards to their food procurement methods, and I'm going to show you this, the data, the picture that I, I have gathered on animal food. Well, this is uh, hunting and gathering has, uh, as, as we all know, as Sona told us earlier, has uh, 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 is a, is still exists in a natural way along with the domesticated forms of resources. Uh, hunting and gathering, as we said. So the region of Mani is one such region that uh, because it's been a marginal econ economy, it has maintained the significance of these forms of economy, hunting and gathering, till to our days, in fact. So this is the place also that we were, were planning to have our course next summer, and I'm really hopeful that we will be able to, to do this and welcome you in, uh, in Mani, which is my particular, uh, so my, my, well, my origin come is from actually. So if we click here, I have created a sort of a pyramid. We can see that the, the traditional pattern was that uh, gathering food from the wild had the, the most of the contribution in terms of animal uh, sources uh, and that the uh, and what I, 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 hear, I hear from the Yayas and Papus there is that uh, people, men, men and women, uh, used to collect the various uh, seafood, shellfish, urchins and so on from the source of their um, uh, land. And also bird collection was important. And I would say this is collection rather than hunting, because as you see on the picture in the right, this is a picture from eight, 1965 showing a, a, a woman, a manured woman, uh, which she, who is catching quail by net. This was a practice that was uniformly practiced in the month of September during the southward migratory trip of, of the quail as they passed over the peninsula of Mani. Uh, and it's uh, indicative that the month of, of September, in a, it's called in colloquial manioc uh, 
language. There is a, as the catcher of the quail, Ardicolois, they call it. Antonia, one minute. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, the next uh, click, actually the next two clicks uh, we can have, and we can see the relative contribution of um, a goat herding, which are, go are raised semi-wild uh, in money. And finally, the home raised uh, animals, uh, which is the, the list of the contribution, some chicken and the pig, which traditionally uh, was slaughtered in the household in a ceremonial manner in the heart of, of the winter and within the concept of the carnival celebrations. On the next slide, now we, uh, I'm going to move to, to the current situation again. Uh, and see how some forms of um, meat hunting of uh, wild food being incorporated into the diet of people is a troubling, is a very troubling issue nowadays. Actually, I, this is what Sona mentioned before, but I think by, by referring to informal markets. Uh, what has uh, changed the, uh, this uh, over the past uh, few decades is the scale of commercialization of such, uh, of such meat coming from the wild in, uh, in specific parts of the world, particularly in Asia and Africa. Uh, so from a, this practice of hunting wild meat from a local subsistence practice evolved into, inter, into an international business. And besides hunting to support the nutrition of poor households, uh, wild animals are hunted to be trafficked via illegal routes and to be sold at high prices to cities and in very, in very distant countries. A variety of animal species are hunted for the needs of this industry. And we see some on this slide uh, lying on, on a table, reptiles, pangolins, many others, and even sometimes great apes such as chimpanzees and gorillas. In Asia today, several communities support this international market for wild meat. Uh, in some cases, wild animals are not captured from the wild, but are bred in captivity. This is also a big problem, are kept in farms that are not regulated, that uh, hygienic conditions are absent, and uh, where, uh, are, where they're kept together with domesticated ones like chicken, goats, and so on. So in this way, this illegal business, this illegal trade of wild animal increases very much the chances of new infectious agents, pathogens, such as SARS and so on, being passed to man. Uh, so this illegal business of wild meat is, you know, as you know, probably is the many hypothesis that has been put forward to explain the emergence of the new coronavirus uh, in China last year. Here is an article of, coming from The Guardian, uh, where it's mentioned that though governments and the World Health Organization have contemplated since quite a long time on banning this trade of wild animals, this ban has not been activated due to the consequences it would have to millions of poor people who live on this trade, on this illegal trade in, in Asia and Africa. So uh, as, as we said, as we, we saw farming the, and uh, livestock production, intense life productions poses a great threat to the environment. It has altered about half of the land globally today, and it causes uh, the loss of forests and, uh, and nature. And in this way, it also brings wild animals in closer contact to humans. Uh, so the question is, let's see then the final one, as to what does more environmental change, damage? What does more environmental damage, eating meat from the wild or from a factory farm? Uh, I don't have an answer to this, but for sure a, a wise uh, decision would be to cut down meat consumption in our societies. And this we should do it urgently to protect ourselves from pandemics as well. 
Well, thank you so much for your attention. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm also uh, hopeful that we will be able to do some live ones in next year after the pandemic. Thank you, Antonia, very much. Uh, and um, we'll, go, uh, we'll have uh, some time for questions later in discussion. Uh, I'm going to now to present uh, Professor pa uh, Panos Skandamis, uh, who is a professor of food microbiology and food hygiene in Agricultural University of Athens. And uh, he's also a member of Biological Hazards uh, uh, Panel at EFSA, European Food Safety Authority, the equivalent of uh, 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 USDA, FDA. Uh, he, Panos received his uh, bachelor's degree from uh, uh, Food Science and Technology Department in, uh, at Agricultural University of Athens, where he did also his PhD on food microbiology. And then he moved uh, to Colorado State University for, I think, for a couple of years. And uh, for the last 15 years, he has been pro uh, professor. He, he, he's, uh, uh, professor at the Department of Food Science and Technology. He's uh, one of the most uh, promising uh, faculty members of Greece. Uh, although he's quite uh, young, has over than 170 publications. Uh, he has got uh, a lot of uh, research projects. Uh, he has supervised already PhDs. Some of them are already professors or uh, directors in the R&D departments, either in Greece or elsewhere. And uh, I'm, uh, he's uh, always uh, uh, very, uh, very good with uh, his students. I have uh, uh, everybody says, especially his uh, students. And I'm very happy to hear Panos today. Panos. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Karathanos. Thank you very much for this kind invitation, the kind words. Uh, I'm really flattered and uh, I'm really happy to give this presentation to you, uh, which is entitled Microbiology and Food Systems. And apparently because of the topic of this nice and very exciting webinar, uh, it will be focused on food safety, on microbial food safety. Uh, so I hope you all see my screen and uh, the change of the slides. Yes, we can see them. Okay, perfect. So I will skip the outline of presentation uh, in the interest of time, but it will be a, a, an overview through the uh, basic concepts and the recent advancements in the area of hazard and risk uh, assessment, uh, 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 especially trying to convey some flavor of the really new concepts uh, introduced globally uh, and uh, are really taking this uh, food safety issue to a, a very different level. When we talk about food safety, practically we, we, everybody has in mind the uh, very famous and the globally established term HACCP, Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point, which was commissioned by NASA uh, and uh, implemented by Pillsbury as the first company uh, almost half, year, half a century ago in order to protect the, say, the health of uh, astronauts uh, in uh, space missions. It was a preventing system and preventive system that was hazard based. So it was oriented to the reasons that cause the disease like salmonella or chemical contaminants like pesticides or mycotoxins. But it was not really addressing what we call now risk, which is the possibility of becoming ill because of consumption of the food. And since HACCP, uh, since the establishment of HACCP, which was further documented and supported by Codex Alimentarius, we have a series of evolution, evolutionary documents uh, reaching the EU food law in 2002, the establishment of uh, traceability, uh, European Food Safety Authority, the new transparency law that was released uh, last January, uh, last November, sorry, uh, the precaution principle in case we don't have enough evidence for a, a public health threat coming from foods. Then in the States, we have FESMA, Food Safety Modernization Act, with seven major principles. We have new EU policies that uh, 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 secure 
the availability of food, food security, but also the sustainability of food production systems for the whole food supply chain and the sustainability of in environmental, economic and social terms. And I'm glad to also uh, introduce the new blueprint of FDA, the new era of smarter food safety, uh, which has four components, high tech traceability, new tools for outbreak investigation, uh, new business models, especially now with COVID, we have e-foods, okay? And uh, last but not least, food safety culture. So uh, pretty much the topic of this webinar. So from, uh, however, all these years, from 1979, uh, 59, since the establishment of HACCP, we have moved from the hazard-based to risk-based thinking. So the hazard is the shark, is the food, is, is sorry, is the, is, is, the, is the presence of the pathogen in the food, the consumer is the swimmer, and when these two are met, there are different likelihoods of the shark actually attacking and eating the consumer. Huh? But this is not uh, uh, one thing. This is not a point estimate. It is the, the risk of the consumer becoming ill because of the consumption of a contaminated food requires that the food is contaminated, and this is something that does not happen at the 100% probability, and that the dose of the hazard in this food is enough to cause illness. So that's why risk equals the product of probability times severity of the disease. So the takeaway message is there is no zero risk. There is actually residual risk. And that's why it is a probabilistic expression. Even such a low probability as 0.001 of illness is a risk, which means is equivalent to one people out of a thousand getting ill because of a consumption of a contaminated product containing a hazard that is not properly addressed through the HACCP system, despite the compliance of the whole food supply chain, but it is the combination of those and the severity of the hazard that may lead to some level of illness. So these are the major principles of risk assessment, hazard identification, exposure assessment, which is also relevant to the frequency of consumption, hazard characterization and risk characterization. And when we move from hazard to risk, we have two major challenges. We have to address variability and uncertainty. Variability is uh, naturally occurring in nature. We cannot do anything about it except for describing it. And there is variability in the conditions of the food supply chain. There is variability in the behavior of the microorganisms. Uncertainty is actually our lack of data about properly describing how microbes behave in the food system. Some examples of variability. So we have variability in, in, the process, in the conditions occurring in the food supply chain. We have variability in temperature. Not all consumers behave the same regarding the domestic storage. Not all supermarkets, not all retailers maintain products at the same temperature. But the, if we take into account all these data, we have variability distributions describing the variability of temperature. But the microorganisms also do not behave equally. Huh? So this is an example of how the growth rate of microorganisms change over time. And these curves relate to microorganisms that are either genetically identical or at least very similar. But you see that their limits for growth, the minimum, maximum, or optimum temperature for growth do not match with each other for different strains. And we are talking about 168 strains here in this study. So we have variability. How variability affects our assessment about risk? Huh? So if this is an example of how E. coli may cause illness, uh, present in ground beef, may cause illness to consumers by eating a burger. E. coli comes from animal fishes. So there is a variability in the amount and the likelihood of having E. coli in fishes. Also, burgers are stored at retail at different temperatures, as I mentioned before. Also, consumers cook the burgers at different levels depending on their preferences. And if all this combined, then it means that each individual consumer has a probability of being exposed to a certain dose of E. coli capable of causing illness. So if you follow the black lines, these are middle case scenarios. So we have an average temperature. We have a very low concentration and prevalence of E. coli in feces, which contaminate the meat after slaughtering. We have well done cooking of the burgers, which is the proper compliant technique. And this uh, in, re, this results in a probability of illness out on the left of this distribution, which is closer to the lower uh, values for probability of illness. But now, if we follow a different line of combination, 
then if we have improper temperature during retail, if we have high prevalence and contamination increases, and if the consumers do not cook the burgers well, then, sorry, then the probability of illness is really high for these consumers. So what consumers and how they will, which, what, what will be the fate and the lack of the consumers eating a burger is the outcome of the combination of all these variable factors. And this is how, what we address in risk assessment. But eventually, where do we put the cutoff in food safety? There is no cutoff. We have to combine two things. The appropriate level of protection, which is decided by the government or the standard agent, food agencies, based on the true public health situation for different hazards in different foods. So if you divide the 96,000 cases of salmonella in Europe per the population of Europe, then you can identify what is the problem of salmonella. Imagine doing that for different hazards. And then you can set an ALOF, an appropriate level of protection. And this appropriate level of protection, which is the maximum tolerable level, what we do now in lockdown, we have certain emergency units in hospitals and we don't want the patients to exceed this value. This is an ALOF. To not to exceed these values, we need to set food safety objectives. So which is the concentration of the virus in case of COVID or which is the concentration of the hazards that needs to be present at the time of consumption on the food product of concern. So imagine that we have to compare the dose and the severity and all this makes us makes up the risk. Let's go a little bit deeper into this uh, 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 definition of risk. The probability of exposure. The probability of exposure is something that relates to the likelihood of the pathogen entering the chain and the increase or reduction during the consecutive stages of the chill chain or of the food supply chain. HACCP is applied separately into each of these uh, uh, stages, but all of them cumulatively may lead to the exposure, may determine the exposure of the consumer to a hazard. If the exposure is below the food safety objective, then we meet the ALOP, so we meet the public health goal. So how can we assess that? We need to take into account a food chain approach, and we have tools for that. We have now smart tools that can transfer remotely information about the conditions, the conditions of storage or of transport of a food product over the globe. Temperature, oxygen in the in the packaging up in the packaging material in the headspace of the packaging, relative uh, moisture um, uh, of uh, the environment, and imagine that these through RFID transmitters can be transferred globally. And together with GPS systems, we can know what is the temperature or what are the storage conditions of a product along its transportation around the globe. And this is the information of time temperature that we can collect this way. And how can we translate that into food safety? By predictive models, by equations that take into account the changes of the red dots here, which are the temperature during distribution of a particular product, and this blue line is the simulation of the microbial growth inside the product. So we don't need to do the experiment anymore. We can collect time temperature data and we can convert them to prediction of the levels of a pathogen or of a spoilage organism in the product. Which once we know also its global uh, geographical point system, then we can know where something uh, went wrong. Or we may have smart indicators. This is an area where we work a lot in our lab. We have developed smart sensors in the packaging that turn color from white to blue, for example, if the product is exposed to temperature abuse and can let the consumer know in a non-destructive way without being scientists whether the product has undergone severe temperature abuse. And when we talk about predictive modeling tools, you can visit different softwares. One of the softwares I have the pleasure and honor to present is one that we have developed it is user friendly, can be found in this address, and you can try really introduce conditions of the processing or of the food chain, and you can select combinations and path of pathogens and foods in order to get prediction about its behavior. So moving from the probability component, uh, the, uh, we go to the severity component of the risk. How the severity was assessed? Back in the uh, beginning of 20th century, there were 12 chemists, crazy and brave chemists, that were testing individual toxic compounds in order to see if they are safe or if they would develop symptoms. That was a very empirical and brave approach. 
But since then, we have a lot of animal models. Now we have guinea pigs, we have zebrafish, we have marine uh, animal models, and they can give us these dose response models, the dose of the hazard and correlated with the probability of illness. So this can tell us how effective is a hazard. Imagine these two curves, they may represent the same hazard for two different individuals. So apparently the, the red line refers to very susceptible individuals, which can become ill with very high, lower doses compared to immunocompetent individuals, or may represent one individual against two different hazards. Apparently the red line would represent the most aggressive hazard, which would uh, cause illness uh, at a much lower dose than another hazard. But the outcome is both a combination of the hazard, of the food that enables the survival or the growth of the hazard, and the immune system of the host, the immune response of the host. And this is an example of a listeria quantitative microbial risk assessment. So similarly to the one I described before for E. coli on burgers, then we identify, we see here the distribution of listeria in different ready-to-eat products at the time of consumption. This is a very official risk assessment. So what we see here is we have, thank God, the majority of food products of listeria being contaminated with low levels, which means low risk. But the David is at the tape. There is a minority of food products that is contaminated with very high levels of listeria because some, a lot of things went wrong. Remember the distributions I showed you before. Either the temperature was too high, the storage temperature, or the product were mishandled by the consumer, or listeria strains were very aggressive and highly growing in these products. So there is a minority of products that carries a high levels of listeria capable of causing growth. And this is a very nice example. So out of this 100%... Sorry? One more minute. Yes, thank you. So there is there is one a uh, hundred percent uh, exposure of uh, out of these uh, 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 strains that we have been exposed uh, by consuming foods. The majority of the disease comes from a minority of strains which are very very aggressive. So which means that we have variability in the aggressiveness of uh, of the strains. I would go a little bit fast in order to conclude. I would like to stay only on these uh, hotspots here, spread of antimicrobial resistance. So we are threatened by bacteria that because of uh, over excessive use of antibiotics in the animal life, in the livestock, they are becoming resistant, which means that they can be more difficultly uh, 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 mitigated when they cause illness to humans. How do we define all these resistant factors and all these genetic uh, related traits in different bacteria? Now we have tools, eh? we have whole genome sequencing, we have bioinformatic tools that enable us to better characterize what is happening in reality. Because in order to have safe foods, we need to have safe people, safe environment and safe animals. I would like you to draw your attention to this very nice uh, 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 special issue in international general food microbiology that they talk about omics in microbial risk assessment. So I conclude my presentation by saying that we are moving to the next generation microbial risk assessment. So we have meta, we, we have to, we have tools to study the composition of a complex microbial population in foods like those that you can see here. These populations interact with each other and determine the phenotypic behavior in the final food and in the host. So we have two to characterize all these trends. And now we have a better insight of how microbial uh, microbes behavior in the food, depending on, on the food ecology and the host. So we can identify genetic markers. We can identify what happens in the genome and what are the resistance genes that may cause, may increase the threat to the consumers. We can identify single nucleotide polymorphism that can explain the different behavior of strains in a food supply chain. And this is an example here that we have for hysteria. We have strains in red, which are really associated with clinical infections because you can see that they can reach very high populations in liver and in brain of animals or in humans. While we have strains that are isogenic, genetically identical, 
but they cannot reach really high le uh, values, high levels in the human organs because they are not as aggressive. So these strains, these blue strains, can hurt only people that are very susceptible. While these red strains, which are clonal complex one, two, whatever, this is a molecular characterization of the strains, they can cause infection even to very immunocompetent uh, individuals. And if we, when we screen different strains, that's an example of studies that we do in our lab, when we screen different strains of salmonella with regards to their limits for growth, you can see this line separating the transition from gr no growth to growth pH values. And you see that for the different strains, this interface is not matching. So we have variability in the interface between strains. Why is that? Because the protein map of the strain, something that we cannot see unless we do the proper genetic analysis, is different between strains, which means that certain strains possess hidden tools, weapons, in order to resist microbial stresses. This is another indication how microorganisms may interact with each other in the gut system. So this is the behavior of Listeria monocytogenes in the presence of different organisms. So you see here that in the presence of Bacillus subtilis, which is a very prevalent organism, Listeria cannot grow. So Listeria is inhibited and cannot express its virulence factors. That's why you see here the underexpression on the gray lines, gray bars of virulent genes in the presence of Bacillus subtilis and cannot inv uh, invade epithelial cells when it is found in the GI tract of the humans. And the opposite can occur with the black bars when it is cultured together with Listeria inocua. So the microbial interactions determine how virulent pathogens may become even in the gut system. And finally, in these systems, in these food systems, we have microenvironments. And the microenvironments actually are not evident macroscopically, but only if we dive into the food systems. So pathogens occur in low levels in foods, and there is variability in the microenvironments in foods, and there is variability in the individual cells. So collecting all this, if we measure the, the, the pH of a food, we think it's an average 5.6, but there are microenvironments in the food where pH might be lower and we cannot measure that. And in this case, the microorganisms behave differently. So we have growth, we have survival, we have death responses. How different are the responses of microorganisms in these three categories? These are the, sorry, the last videos I would like to show you as a takeaway. So you see here that we have individual cells from the same organism, but behaving differently in the three different videos. So we have cells that grow really nice, we have cells that grow very slow or different from the with different gener, uh, growth rate than others. And we have cells that do not manage to multiply, but they simply elongate. And these cells belong to the same organism. They are not different organisms. They are the same cells. In a bacterial colony in a food, you have cells in the middle of the colony that suffer and they are exposed to their own metabolic products and they express the acid adaptation genes while the same cells in the periphery of the colony, in the outside of the colony, do not express these genes. But when we eat the food, we eat all types of cells together. So some of them will eventually reach the host and cause the infection. Huh? And when we sanitize equipment with a, with, a sanitation, with a sanitizer like parasitic acid and bezalconium chloride, you see that not all cells die immediately. According to this video, you have cells, sorry, you have cells uh, that actually, no. yes, I'm, 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 I'm one more slide, one more slide. Yeah. yeah. Yes, thanks. So you see that there are cells that are destroyed from outside to inside, but not simultaneously, yeah? which means that they have different resistance. And this is evident in this final slide here. When we hit products at 70, 57 degrees Celsius, the red fluorescence dye indicates when the cells are destroyed, so the dye goes into the cell and kills them. But this, when they are heated at 57 degrees, this does not happen to all cells simultaneously. So it happens in different times. So not all cells die at the same time because not all cells are equally sensitive to heat. 
And as you see, you have the appearance of red color gradually, and you have the intensity of the red color also changing gradually, suggesting that you have a variability at the single cell level. And actually in foods, we have contamination with low levels. So the problem comes from the very, very low, highly resistant populations, which are selected by the mild processing or by the subliminal environments that are formed in foods. And this is what risk assessment tries to address. Collectively, address the variability and actually the uncertainty that we have related to the populations of single cells and the variability in the processing and storage conditions. Thank you very much for your patience. My apologies for taking this extra time. Any questions are more than welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Panos. Really, really uh, excellent presentations. All three presentations were, were excellent. Um, I'm gonna ask Gohema to put up the slides for our moderators. So um, our two moderators today are Dr. Joachim Saki and Dr. Vyas Karathanos. Um, Dr. Saki is an assistant professor in the Department of Clinical and Preventive Nutrition Sciences at Rutgers University School of Health Professions. Dr. Saki is a nutritional epidemiologist with interest in HIV-related comorbidities associated with poor diet, as well as racial and sexual minority health. He earned his MPhil from the University of Ghana School of Allied Health Sciences and an MS and PhD from the Tufts University Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy before joining Rutgers University School of Health Professions. And Dr. Vyos Karathanos uh, graduated from the School of Chemical Engineering National Technical University of Athens. He obtained a Master's of Science and a PhD from the Department of Food Science at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. Dr. Karathanos has worked for 10 years in the food and chemical industry and about 20 years in research institutions and universities. Since 20, 2004, he serves as Professor of Food Engineering and Physical Chemistry at the Department of Nutrition at Harakopia University in Athens. He supervises several research projects, both in academia and the food industry, and has participated in many research projects in Europe and the US. In the last 10 years, he has been the principal investigator in more than 18 research projects, and he has published 103 research papers, has two patents, and has co-organized four international symposia. Um, Dr. Karathanos was my contact first at Harakopio, so uh, I, I, he is very much responsible for uh, beginning this collaboration that we are so excited to be having between Rutgers and Harakopio. So at this point, I would like to encourage people to um, use the chat box to um, add uh, any questions that they might have. Uh, alternatively, if you click on the participants box, you should see a place to raise your hand. Dr. Saki will be monitoring the um, chat box and Dr. Karathanos will uh, monitor questions for individuals who would like to uh, open up their uh, camera and videos and ask the questions verbally. Um, so we have a few questions. Um, there's one question that was originally directed at the dean, but since it's not here, Dr. Patinante, you can take it. So okay. the question is that um, the dean mentioned how for the holidays, one should take both the PCR and the rapid COVID test before visiting relatives. So which order should they be taking in? What's the interval between the two? What's the interval between taking the test and going home? And what, what other things can people do in terms of going home for the holidays? Okay, I would also like to, I will answer the question, but I will also like, um, I would, again, I'm just making sure that all of our panelists have their cameras on and they do, good. Um, so the answer to the question is um, the Dr. Uh, Halkidis was encouraging people to take both tests simultaneously or we, you know, within a short period of time, same day if possible. And the idea would be that the, the quick test would give you, if it was positive, you would know not to go. Uh, if it was negative, the other test, the PCR test, will take a little longer to get the result, but it would confirm your, your negative status. I would just add that um, the Centers for Disease Control has a lot of very good information on um, what to do for Thanksgiving and the recommendations, including the fact that if it's possible to eat outside with people, first of all, their recommendation is to um, 
really only have people who are in your immediate family in your household uh, at, at Thanksgiving. If you are going to have other people in your uh, come to your home, obviously limit that. If you can eat outside, it would be better. If you're going to eat inside, it would be better um, to um, have windows open. Uh, and then they have lots of specific advice for uh, wearing masks if necessary. Uh, social distancing as much as possible, keeping utensils and food separate um, if possible. So, um, but the answer to the question about the testing is to take them both at the same time. Follow up, can I follow up on that question? My question, yes, I, asked, I, I asked the question, should they be taken on the same day or rather have a gap between the two, like three, four days, I don't no, know. I, I think Dr. Halkidis is recommending at the same time. It's just, you're gonna get the results from the PCR test later. Okay. Okay. Um, and I have a question for Dr. Down. So um, as she spoke um, about her, the, the food systems topic, like we know people have lost income and there is a disparity like globally and within the US. So, and as people lose income, people's budgets are stretched, focusing on rent and key essentials. Like the food budgets are shrinking and that means people are looking for value for whatever money they have to spend on food. And, that invariably leads to people purchasing more um, processed foods, more packaged foods, which are less healthier. So how can we reimagine the food system, let's say in the US, so that um, we can ensure that healthy foods, fruits and vegetables, fish are cheap and affordable and people can be able to like improve their diet quality within these difficult periods? Great, thanks, Saki. Um, I mean, I think that there are a few things that we need to do. There's not a silver bullet in any way. Um, I think, you know, right now people need access to money. And so, you know, in the US they still haven't passed the new stimulus package. And that's really problematic. I think in, you know, a de developing world context we often use cash transfers as a way to ensure that people can access high quality diets. And there's a ton of evidence to show that if you have access to cash transfers and you're, low, you're a low income person, your diet quality improves. And in some cases, some of your nutrition outcomes improve as well. Um, so if we can do something like that in the US, that's obviously ideal to address the immediate concern related to diet quality. Um, another aspect is in terms of, you know, the food environment that people access, food pantries have been playing much bigger, a much bigger role more recently because of COVID-19. And unfortunately, at the same time that there's this um, greater reliance on food pantries, a lot of them have closed. And so there needs to be better um, tracking of which pantries are open, when they're open, what, what are they providing people? Do they have fresh fruits and vegetables and that type of thing. So I think in terms of organizing, there's some work that can be done there too. And then lastly, from a production standpoint, I think we need to focus on local production. So we saw with COVID-19 that some of these long supply chains really meant that they were broken. And so they weren't able to access the markets that they were used to. And so then that led to dumping. So one way to try and address this is to use shorter supply chains. And so, for example, in New Jersey, we actually have a lot of agricultural production, uh, but there isn't great um, distribution in terms of, for example, getting that food to Newark. And so Newark obviously has um, high levels of food insecurity, especially when you compare it to other parts of the state. And so if we can create some better distribution systems and there's some work being done in terms of food, food hubs uh, within the city, it can really help to bring that high quality produce to low income consumers. And then that, at the same time, when people have access to local produce and they see even you know, urban agriculture they start to demand it more. They have a stronger connection with that food and want to eat well. And so that's also another important component to consider. But I think we have to do a lot of different things. And um, I think to start off, people need access to more money. Thanks. Um, so um, I have a question for Dr. Dr. Matalas too. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, but you spoke about the aspirational nature of meat and how um, as people's um, like incomes and things increase, meat increase, and, and that is common not only in Greece, it's common in Ghana where I come from and other places because um, if you like, those are some of the expensive 
parts of the dish that people of lower income can afford. So can't afford. So as they get more income, they aspire for it. So to improve like people's diet quality, to encourage people to eat easier, how do you change perception? Like we know the Eat Lancet report, eat more plants, but it's, it's difficult to sell that message to, to my dad who had his first pizza when he was 69 years old. Like he, he has not been able to afford it. So suddenly he should eat plants. How, how do you market it to, to people for people to change? Thank you, Joachim. Uh, so you, you, to make sure that I understood well, you're asking how people would be persuaded to, uh, to, to prefer meat less than they do. Well, I think this is, um, we should first uh, target people in affluent societies and in societies where meat consumption is really high today. The, the developing countries, they, it's been recently that they have gained access to some considerable amounts of meat. And I, I think fast, the fast food industry, not I think, the data show that the fast food industry in fact has added a lot into this, the, the, the hamburgers and so on. So the, 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 uh, the target, I mean, the goal is to, to have uh, affluent societies reduce their meat intake quite a lot. Uh, uh, while the de some developing and poor countries may still increase it, so they both come closer to no more than 100, on the average, no more than 100 uh, grams of meat per day. I mean, uh, nowadays in Greece, we are close to, we're getting close to, a, to two, the average amount, the, the estimate is for, for almost 200 grams of meat per person, which is high, it's not as high as in uh, Poland, but it's still high. It's not as high as in Australia, but and so we can reduce a lot. In the US as well, it can be shrunk a lot. So uh, the, the consumers there have to be offered other, presented with other choices such as uh, sustainable diets. Uh, the Mediterranean diet is one, uh, model that may work and which includes animal source food and and is palatable and and it takes also education but also if if the production changes and they are and and, and i mean you can't get much cheaper food anymore uh, meat anymore i mean the way it's now produced in the industrial scale it's 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 so cheap in for what it is that the, that should be, uh, that can be changed as well, I think. I mean, it has reached its limits. And in, in fact, um, uh, more than half of the deforestation that has taken place in uh, Asia in particular is due to, um, and in, in South America, it's due to livestock farming. That's it. So it's, it's really reached the, <laughs> the zenith right now. Okay, thanks. Um, I think the next question will go to you too, since I know you work with the Mediterranean diet. So someone is asking whether is the quarantine an opportunity to implement the Mediterranean diet and its elements like being involved in food preparation and having like an afternoon rest? I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not I didn't hear very well. Uh, could you repeat or? Yeah, there's a question about- Are the, the, are the, um, the in the quarantine? You know? Yeah, this is the question from George. Sorry, yeah, yeah, actually, actually, yes, yes, from George. Thank you, George, for the question. Well, uh, I think George is, is very right that the quarantine is, a, is an uh, opportunity to do more uh, cooking, more involved more into culinary activities and become imaginative and uh, creative in our kitchen. And this is uh, in line with the... Um, also with uh, diets that are plant-based such as the Mediterranean because you have to work with the ingredients quite a lot at home. So that's, but it's, it's also, it's a, it's a lesson to be learned. We can keep this, if I, I've, I hear of many people who do cook more nowadays because they stay home and it, I, I think that we should strive to uh, gain uh, things from this uh, experience and a new habits and develop new habits for, for the future without an epidemic, <laughs> when the epidemic is gone. There is another question from, uh, I guess, from uh, uh, Professor Papadimitriou. 
that uh, given the rarity of viral pandemic events, is it necessary to invest heavily in uh, research uh, on how to address such situations as, uh, uh, or in terms of food insecurity? Possibly Professor Skandamis could answer this. Uh, do we have to invest on this uh, heavily? Yeah, I think, I, I, I think that uh, there are many sides of the same problem. Huh? First of all, it needs to be, it needs to be made clear that uh, uh, COVID is not a food safety threat, uh, but it's certainly a threat of the food supply chain in terms of uh, um, attacking the manpower and reducing the workforce of people involved in the food supply chain. So that's the one thing. The second thing is that uh, when we have social distances or, uh, and lockdown, local lockdown downs applied uh, throughout the globe, we limit the mobility of human, but we cannot afford limiting the mobility of food, which means that food, food somehow continue to travel and send around the world. And as I said, certainly it's not a food safety threat, but research is needed in order to address the survival properties of the virus on the so-called fomits. So the liquids, the packaging materials, especially under frozen conditions. It is a new data, new information that I convey here that there was a list of 800 cases uh, in a local Chinese city last of August and the source of the problem was the packaging material of frozen foods. Because compared, according to new evidence, although it is well known that uh, the virus survives about maximum 72 hours on most uh, known surfaces, and it is enhanced by moisture and probably lower temperatures, in the freezing, under freezing conditions, this may extend to more than a week or maybe a month which means that practically these food packages may become a, a, a kind of indirect vehicle of different viral loads all around the planet. Of course, this is an extreme situation, but we have to consider that what we're trying to solve here is we're trying to minimize the, exp any, the exposure of any citizens, any consumers, not uh, from eating a food contaminated with coronavirus. That's not an issue. But we are trying to, ex to, to limit the exposure to the virus by any route of contamination. That's why we said we have to limit touching contaminated areas, keep cleaning the hands. And the basic solution is whatever you do before you touch your face, make sure you clean your hands. So that's the major hygiene measure. But I think that uh, and whether we need to invest research, I would say that it will be a sort of deposit for the years. So whatever we, we identify now in the effort to understand the behavior of coronavirus on surfaces, not in the GI tract, huh? on surfaces, on comets, whatever area we invest here, including the measures to fight the coronavirus, I think it will be a sort of deposit for future threats. And maybe in the future, we would not need to spend any more uh, this, type of, uh, this type of research funding. Because we have every, every century has a lot of pandemics. But uh, what changes is the causative agents and how the preparedness of people against this different type of pandemics. I don't know if I answered the question, but. I think it was a very stimulating question. Costas, thank you very much. May, may, may I add uh, a little bit? And maybe Mariam wants to, mention, to comment on this, that um, I'm not a microbiologist, but, but the, the, viral pandemic, the viral pandemic events, as uh, Costas asked, are rare, but uh, so, a few of them are so fatal that it does deserve uh, for research to be done. It's the research cannot, is not restricted to food safety and it's not basically food safety, research on food safety, it's on public health. So we, the humanity has faced the major um, threats and, and fatal uh, uh, 
incidence from uh, viral and bacterial in, uh, infections, we have to we can uh, think of the of the influence of the Hispanic flu in the beginning of 20th century, which killed uh, more than I think two million people in Europe, way more than uh, World War II, uh, One that was at the same time going on in Europe. And the other bacterial, of course, mostly infections, which have killed, the, who have cut in the past the population of Europe into half, uh, practically, like uh, tuberculosis or um, the plague, which the, the plague had several attacks. And actually, in some parts of the world, is still going on. It's been a major killer. Uh, for societies across the world. So it's, the, the events are so, although they are not uh, so commonly, it's not so common to take the, 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 to become a pandemic. When they do, it's so, it's, the threat is so big that it, of course, it, we have to take measures to prevent uh, the new. And what I, I showed is that uh, all these contagious diseases come to us from animals. That's what history has shown us since antiquity, since the, the time of ancient Greeks uh, in uh, classical Greece, and even today, it's it's this threat comes. The, the vehicle is uh, our contact with animals, so we have to be to focus on that. Uh, professor, can I just add? Sorry, can I just add one thing very quickly? Uh, Sona, um, can I can I uh, ask you something actually? Because there is okay. a so you can answer both, actually. Okay. Uh, there is a question from uh, Professor Nomikos, our graduate director, uh, who says, do you believe that the food that the supplement sector will take advantage of this pandemic producing functional foods and dietary supplements with the claim of boosting the immune system? Can you uh, answer both? Can you say sure. yeah. or answer this also? Okay, so the first thing that I just wanted to mention is that, you know, the pandemic is a shock. It's a shock to the food system. And we are gonna see other shocks moving forward. It might not be a pandemic, but surely we're gonna see climate shocks. And you see a lot of the same um, repercussions and propagations throughout the food system that you see with the pandemic when you have a climate shock, like a flood, a hurricane, or what have you. And so it's important to do work and research in terms of, of understanding all these connections and how we can make food systems more resilient because we're gonna have shocks moving forward. They might just not be a pandemic. Um, so in terms of the question related to food supplements, I think the answer is yes. Um, not that I have solid evidence to suggest that, but um, you know, it's a huge industry. In the US it's a you know, billion dollar industry. And I think that they will most definitely capitalize on it just like you know, the food industry is capitalizing on it in terms of their marketing. Um, we did for our rapid assessment tool, we were also asking in different countries if people were consuming different products because of COVID-19. Um, and uh, mostly the populations that we've asked these questions to are living in rural areas. And in some cases they are using different plants and that type of thing in order to try and prevent uh, COVID-19. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that there are going to be supplements or people are using more supplements at the moment um, but i can't say with certainty in terms of in terms of actual data to back that up okay thank you sona there is also a statement uh, uh, or a question uh, from uh, eddie mitsu who says uh, i believe that uh, also this is an opportunity for promoting the food consumption the family table that can reduce over overeating and maybe improve the quality of food options. I don't know, Adonia, if you want to make a statement on uh, Evie's uh, statement? I, I totally agree. It's, uh, yes, that uh, con, con getting together is, uh, is, is one uh, positive outcome of this uh, crisis. <laughs> Get... No, but to add family, to... with family. If as a family we gather around fried chicken, that is not what we want. So it's like we can gather around pizza, we can gather around fried chicken, or we can gather around salads and healthier food. So them um, gathering helps, but um, there, there needs to be that education on eating healthily. Yeah, 
I, I think there's the additional challenge of working remotely and then also having to cook for your family um, while we're in the and and teach our children from home. Uh, so there are competing issues. I think a lot of people are uh, eating takeout food partly to because it's easier to go and get the food somewhere else. And then alternatively, um, they want to support the local businesses that are hurting a lot, the, the restaurant uh, business. So I think they're, um, I, I agree with, with Saki. I think it's a great opportunity, uh, but, I, but I also think there's some challenges. So um, thank you very may much. I ask you, may I also add something and possibly, uh, because uh, during this uh, pandemic's time, uh, the food uh, industry uh, usually uh, actually is, uh, uh, or the consumers buy the standard products, not uh, the, the, uh, uh, the new products, the functional foods. This will be done, I guess, later. Possibly some people from the industry or the, the uh, close to the industry like Professor Scandamis or Professor Carway could make a statement on this. I think this time uh, there is no room for new products during the pandemics. But after that, after that, in one year from now, I think will be a lot of room for development of supplements. Right now, they, most of the companies sell the standard products. Uh, and uh, I think, but in the future, will, uh, they will... Uh, start doing uh, business with uh, the new products. Uh, so, sorry, Marian. <laughs> oh, that's fine. <laughs> so I wanted to thank everyone, uh, our panelists, particularly for the excellent presentations. I think this has been a really interesting uh, discussion time. And then um, we're, we're, we're running a little bit late. So I'm going to just ask Ohema to put up the slides. Uh, and I'm going to just do a brief introduction uh, so that you know about the course that we are offering with Hotocopio, um, we hope this summer. Uh, this is a course that we developed over a one year period uh, with our colleagues. And uh, it was a study abroad program in Athens uh, and initially planned for summer of 2020. And of course, with the travel restrictions, we were unable uh, to, to have the course. Uh, next slide. So um, the course is called Food and Mediterranean Culture. It's an analysis of food production and consumption uh, in the Mediterranean region using a food systems approach. Uh, we hope to be able to offer the course this summer, either sometime in June or July. Right now we're waiting for instructions from Rutgers Global and to see what happens with the pandemic to see whether we will be able to do this. Uh, this is a course that we um, collaborated with from everything from starting out to what the curriculum would be to actually presenting it with Haracopio University, uh, particularly with Vios and Antonia and George was, is I see George uh, in our group as well. Um, and uh, from the Newark side, from the Rutgers side, um, uh, Shauna Downs and um, Saki have been instrumental in developing the course. You wanna show me the next slide? So this is actually just for, Amer this is for the Rutgers students. This is the cost. Uh, right now, everything is very uh, in flux, but uh, what we have been able to do uh, two years ago when we had a course uh, in Greece, a different course, actually, uh, we were able to uh, provide our students with a thousand dollars scholarship uh, that helped to cover the cost of their flight to Greece. So we, if we actually are able to hold the program, we are hoping to be able to offer scholarships as well. For the Greek students, obviously, so uh, actually next slide, um, Ohema, I think um, this just gives us the, um, the timing, we will know by January of 2021 whether or not we are actually going to be able to run the program. And then we will send out notices to both Rutgers and Haracopio uh, for students to apply. Next slide. So the idea is that we would have 16 students from Rutgers that would be from the School of Public Health and the School of Health Professions. 
Uh, and uh, if there's still openings, other students from Rutgers can apply. 16 students from Hotokopio University. So in, in total, we're talking about uh, 32 students. The course is taught jointly by Rutgers and Hotokopio faculty. I can tell you that many of my faculty want to come to this class, not only to teach it, but also to enjoy being there in Greece. Um, it's, a it's a combination of classroom learning and in-field learning, as well as cultural activities. Um, and um, there will be some work prior to the course and a little bit after. So it's a three credit course from the American system. And I believe I'd have to double check. It's either four or five Euro European units. Um, and then there, the course grades are based on reflections, group work, a final paper and class participation. Uh, so the cost for Hotokopio students is much less because they don't have to travel to Athens they, and they live in Athens, but we will spend one week um, on the Peloponnesian Peninsula. And so um, there will be a budget for that as well, that we can, we will, uh, will be provided for the students from Hotokopio so they will know the cost of the course. These are the course objectives. Um, by the completion of the course, the students will be able to identify the historical, cultural, and culinary aspects of food consumption within the Mediterranean region, describe the Mediterranean diet model and its health and environmental implications, measure and critically analyze adherence to the Mediterranean diet model, analyze the ways in which local food systems can better support the production and sale of food resources in accordance with the Mediterranean lifestyle and formulate strategies to promote a Mediterranean lifestyle in both Greece and the United States. I, I think that's the, my last slide. That's right. Okay, so we can take those down. Um, we, if anyone has questions about the course, we have a few minutes, we can go a little over time uh, and we will try to answer those questions. Uh, but we will also offer um, information sessions online, which will be sent to students at both institutions so that if they're interested, they can, they'll find out more as we find out what's going to happen in terms of our ability to travel. So any questions? I don't see anything in the chat box yet, but um, we wanted to introduce the course to the faculty and students, as well as others who are on the, um, uh, in this symposium with us today. So um, if there, there are- I yes. have a Is there a limit on the number of students you can take? The limit is, th is a 32, 16 from each site. Okay, thank you. Because we have to, we are doing substantial travel and we also want to be able to have, uh, you know, good interactions between faculty and students. So there will be probably uh, three faculty from um, maybe four from Rutgers who will come to Greece for the program. Um, Dr. Downs, Dr. Saki definitely will be there. Uh, and um, Dr. Uh, Halkidis and I would like to come too. <laughs> so I think there will be, will be faculty. And then obviously we have a high co uh, cooperation with faculty from Hotokopio, Dr. Karathanos, Dr. Matalas, uh, Dr. Bascu. Uh, I know we'll all uh, be there as in addition to other faculty. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? All right, with that, I would say thank you very much. We had such wonderful, we had about 200 people on the webinar today. So this was really a fabulous beginning to our collaboration with Hatakopio. Um, and uh, I thank everyone on the panel, as well as uh, those who participated. Um, and uh, Vios, would you like to say anything before uh, we... I would like to thank you all of you. Marian, thank you very much. Thank you all of you. Ohema, thank you very much for uh, making this uh, Happening and for all your efforts. And uh, definitely, I will see you in uh, Athens in uh, June. Prior okay. to that, possibly I will uh, see some other people. Uh, Mukund, I don't know when you are coming, or Stefan, or, uh, 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 <laughs> or uh, Riva. How, <laughs> thank you very much for, uh, uh, and, uh, for uh, having this event. Ahoyma, thank you again. Good to see Good you all. Thank you so much. Good to see you, Ayos. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Have a great day and stay Thank safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.
Oh, Hema, do we know how many participants were from Greece? Um, I can, we have it in the RMCP link. We so we have all that, yeah. So I can pull that together um, after and oh, and I can stop the recording. 